for me, the problem that I have with kind of structural rigidity of gender roles for men and women is that they hurt men and they hurt women. They hurt both. Uh, they hurt the men who want to stay home longer with their kids. Uh, they hurt men in real physical ways because we do have a problem in this country where women are more likely to be violent, uh, the victims of violence at home. Mm. Men are more likely to be the victims of violence in public. But in both, the common factor is it's men committing the violence by, by and large, not exclusively, but by and large. And so these rigid kind of ideas of masculinity hurt everyone. And so when we talk about fem feminism, when we talk about changing those structures, it's to create an equality for, for the benefit of everyone and to get rid of some of the things that hold everyone back. You want a brief response to that, by the way? Well, the first thing I would say is that um, I'm not anti-feminist per se. I mean, I think the idea that the world would benefit from the movement of talent from both sexes into the workplace as rapidly as possible is something that anyone with any sense should share given the rather, uh, the rarity of talent and the necessity for, for utilizing it. Mm. Um, I do stand by my original statement though that there's a brand of more radical feminism that, that insists that our culture is best characterized as an oppressive patriarchy. And I think that, first of all, that that's an appalling sociological doctrine. And I think it has very negative psychological effects. Mm -hmm. And they won't be limited to men. Because in, if it's true that there's something toxic, let's say, about masculinity per se, what that will ine inevitably mean is that as women adopt more masculine roles, traditionally, what is that toxicity somehow going to go away? But that's a so straw man because no one says there's anything toxic about masculinity per se. What do you mean no one says that? People the term that. exists. No. Well, no they How is that a straw it's man? A well, but where did the term come from? It's a phrase from? that's used about forms of masculinity that are harmful to men and women. It's not about masculinity per se. You must know that. I read the American Psychological this. Association guidelines for the treatment of boys and men, and I know perfectly well that this is no strong ma straw man. And it's not only devoted towards what you might describe as the more aggressive ends of masculine behavior. It's aimed at, at masculinity in a much broader, in a much broader range of, there's a much broader range of accusations that are underlying, that are under the surface than that. And so I don't see in what way at all that it's a strong. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to pause that I argument agree for a second. Disagree. I, I am a very strong proponent of more liberal women in Parliament as well, because I think, I mean, obviously not at the expense <laughs> yeah, of Parliament. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, okay. But I think, that, I think that once we do have all of the parties becoming more equal, then it'll be a more respectful place mm. because people will have more of an opportunity to understand where each other are coming I'd from. I'd like to go back in a minute to our questioner, uh, Ulysses, if he's, uh, if he's there. But Jordan, go ahead. Well, I think we don't address a lot of this systematically. We talk a lot about equality, but there's various forms of equality. There's equality of opportunity, which we discussed briefly, which I think is a very admirable goal. And then there's equality of outcome, which I think is a, well, I think it's an impossibility. I think it's a totalitarian impossibility. And I think it's often conflated with, with equality of opportunity. Equality of outcome, of course, is the doctrine that every, um, every occupation should be occupied by people in precise proportion to their proportionality in the population. So the quotas in politics, for mm. example, or quotas in business as quotas. to how many women should be on boards, quotas, how quotas, many women should it. be politicians, that's yes. what you're talking about. Yes, quotas on the base of, of, of group identity. Mm. Okay. Thanks, a Thanks. Your petition out there. The next question um, comes from Taryn Batten. This is a question for the panel, but mostly for Jordan Peterson. Um, do you believe that a stay-at-home full-time mother is adequately valued in today's society? Uh, as a stay-at-home mother myself, I don't feel valued by wider society, as most of what I hear focuses on women getting back to work as soon as possible. And you don't hear anything about the benefit of staying home and the benefit for the children. Jordan Peterson, start with you. Well, I certainly noticed that when my wife had small kids um, and we used to go out together, you know, and, and of course I had the small kids too. Um, but it was, I, I, made, I stated that way for a purpose, you know, when we would go to restaurants and so forth together, she was often treated with less respect than she would have been had the kids not been with her. And that was, that was very bothersome because, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a sacrifice and, and, a, and a very useful sacrifice to have small children and 
people who have them should be treated with respect. I think that we do an awful lot of lying to women in our society. And I think that's a better answer to your question because um, I think, and I think the data indicates this too, that... Um, what kind of lies do you mean, Jordan? That career is the most important thing in life and is mo most likely to be the case that way for men and for women. I think it is important for more men than for women uh, because women take the primary role for very early child rearing. But it's clearly the case, as far as I can tell, that for most people, and, and the statistics bear this out, that family is by far the most important commitment that people make in their lives. And I think we lie to 18 to 19 year old women nonstop, especially in universities and educational institutions. That's by, it, by the way, sorry. By okay, well, by telling them that career is going to be the fundamental purpose, give the fundamental purpose to their life. And for most people, that's simply not the case, nor should it be. Terry Butler, um, going straight to the question. But one of the great things about being a feminist is that you want everyone to be valued for the inherent dignity that they have as a human being. It's pretty similar to something that Jordan said earlier, of course, and I sometimes think that in these debates we're arguing about things from different perspectives uh, without really understanding each other's perspectives. So can I say this? I think at the same time as saying that perhaps we lie to women, and I, I, don't, I don't accept that, of course, but to go back to the question of what's, diff what's the difference between toxic masculinity and masculinity, it's toxic masculinity to tell boys that they must be providers, mm -hmm. that it's somehow weak to stay home with the kids, that the people who take, the men who take a year off to look after children in early childhood are somehow lesser than men who are out there aggressively fighting for their career. These strict gender-based roles damage everyone. Uh, Martin Luther King's dream was that there would come a time when um, people would not be judged by the colour of their skin but by the content of their character. How is today's identity politics consistent with that vision? Jordan Peterson. Uh, well, I don't think it's consistent with that vision at all. I mean, the, the problem I have with identity politics as a, as a mode of philosophical apprehension is that it's predicated on the idea that the appropriate way to classify people is by their group identity in whatever fragmentary formulation that might take in the multiplicity of ways that people can be divided into groups. And the, the classical postmodern, and I would also say Marxist way of viewing the world, even though those two things shouldn't be allowed together, they tend to be, is that group identity takes priority over individual identity. And I think that's precisely the opposite of what Martin Luther King was hoping for and working for. And, and I, I think it's unbelievably dangerous because, partly because when you, when you assume that people should primarily be identified by their group, then you can also attribute group guilt to them by their group. And then things go downhill very, very rapidly. And we've had no shortage of, of evidence of that sort of thing happening, say, throughout the 20th century. Are there particular groups that you are more concerned about than others? For example, the Liberal Party, as Terry Butler said earlier, is a group. Uh, are there groups that you think are more dangerous? There's a, it is, there isn't a problem with groups. Mm. The problem is with assuming that the fundamental way that you should categorize people is with their group identity. Obviously, we all belong to groups. The issue is whether or not the individual identity is primary and the group identity is secondary, or the group identity is primary and the individual identity is secondary. If you're a proponent, for example, of equality of outcome, of quotas, then you de facto accept the proposition that it's the group identity that is primary, and there's all sorts of dangers that are associated with that that far outweigh whatever good you're likely to do. Okay, well, maybe you just... Go ahead. Maybe you just think that representative democracy should be representative. Mm. Maybe you just think that women should be equally represented in the decision-making fora of our nation. Maybe that's really just about having proper equality in a body that's meant to be representative. Well, I do believe that women should have... I, I don't understand your question, I well, guess. Well, I guess you <laughs> yeah. don't. That's pretty obvious, unfortunately. Well, how about if you phrase it more clearly instead of just insulting me? <laughs> look, 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 look at it this way. Let's talk about quotas for a minute. So there's a, a very wide array of jobs that are fundamentally uh, done by men, 
So for example, member of parliament, the 99.9% po- <laughs> of sorry, bricklayers. I'm sorry, Alex, I'm going to stop sledging you now, I promise. Mm. I, I'm happy to give my minute to Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> 99.9% of bricklayers are men. Should we have quotas for women? Is bricklaying representative democracy? That has nothing to do with the question. The question is if, 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 if there's evidence of structural inequality and oppression because women aren't precisely represented at 50% in all professions at all levels, then why don't we have a conversation about having women represented it in all professions at all levels? Well, we why do we talk about the C-suite, for example? Why do we talk about politics and positions of power? Mm. Why don't well, we talk about it across the board? Okay, we're so we're, about let's just pause and... and uh, yeah, but that's because it's power. You, you pose a question to Terry Butler. Uh, <laughs> go ahead and answer it, then we'll hear from the other panellists. His question to me. Well, yeah, if you'd, about like, if, if you'd like to answer the question about bricklayers. There's nothing wrong with bricklayers. Why there are no of quotas course in there's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... I think you were trying to draw a distinction between bricklaying and running the government. And I was suggesting that a representative democracy should be representative. That was the point I made. And I Represen- think... Representative of it by quota? Well, sure, if that's what it takes. I mean, Yeah, well, that's exactly us. what you would no, say. But, but, you know, I can... I can... <laughs> No, that, just, look, that, that, that just means well, a dreadful strategic inadequacy uh, on look, your really, part. Li- you steer, the Liberal Party steered away from the quotas. I'm loath to interrupt And this, the women are steering um, away from the Liberal Party. I'm actually quite enjoying this. I'm loath to interrupt. I'm, I'm really but enjoying no, they it. They have quotas for the National Party. This, 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 <laughs> this assault on the Liberal Party from people that don't care about us at all and are our political well, enemies is oh, often deeply care. quite mystifying. But the, the absurdity of the position that Terry puts in this quota-based argument over time, it is a reductive, absurd argument. It's like saying no women vote for men and no men vote for women. It is not true. Um, people vote and seek for the best person to represent them in Parliament. Um, so quotas, you, you say quotas are a fabulous thing in the Labor Party because they've helped you meet a target. But there may be a day in our Australian Parliament, and it'll probably come sometime, where we have 75% women in the Parliament. That won't be a problem to me. Do you mean in occurs. 300 years' time when you guys no, finally won't get be a women problem. there? It won't be a problem <laughs> if that occurs that way. And it should occur that way if that's what people want. Okay, but, let's... Thanks, Tavi. This is for Jordan initially. There has been an increasing trend here in Australia that anyone who has a counter view to the socialists, PC lobby, Greens, communist brigade, <laughs> your friend, are shouted, on national television right are shouted now. down, literally. literally, and called racists or homophobics, so that any form of rational debate is difficult, if not impossible, to now have. How can we counter this? Peter, I assume you're, you're, you're making an exception. <laughs> you're making an exception for Q&A, I dare say, because we are having that debate as we speak. And I haven't you... been shouted down. There you go. <laughs> so, you're making progress, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan Peterson. Or oh, you're wrong. Possibly you're just wrong. Jordan Peterson. Possible. Well, look, I've been called every pejorative in the book, I think, except pedophile. But, well, I've kind of tried to keep track of them. Um, one day last year, I was called a Jewish shill and a Nazi the same day, which was, I guess, a high point. Um, the, your, your claim that if we engage in certain types of discussions, this kind of reaction emerges is absolutely the case. I mean, for at least six months after I made what you might describe as my initial political stance, I was swarmed by people who were using every possible pejorative to take me out so that none of my arguments needed to be taken seriously. Um, How do we deal with that? Well, hopefully we stop calling each other cheap names. That would be a nice start um, rather than addressing the issues. But I would also say a certain amount of persistence is called for. If you're mobbed on social media, a brief bit of advice by people who are doing exactly the sort of thing that you're describing, I would say two things. The first is um, be careful about what you've said and what you've said in the past, and maybe it's a bit too late for that. The second thing I would say is if you haven't done anything wrong, do not apologize. That is your minute. Um, And then wait two weeks and it'll go away. Terry Butler. (laughs) Do you accept any truth to um, 
the, the basis of the question uh, from your point of view? I mean, my job is I go and hear different points of views all the time. All I hear is debate. All I hear is people with different opinions. I just don't accept that you can't have an opinion in this country without being shouted down. I mean, it just seems Sorry, so, right. so silly. We've had a number of right-wing people come to this country and then they've had their, their venues targeted. They've had to leave the country because of the radicals of the left that won't let them put a point of view that's different to the socialist left. And it's getting worse. Yeah. I've got a lot of grey hair. Sure. This didn't happen in this country 15 years ago. I have to say, I've got a lot too, but it's pretty well dyed in my case. <laughs> uh, we have right here on national television tonight Professor Jordan Peterson, whom uh, you might know is a figure of some controversy, and I say that with respect. I don't mean it in a pejorative and way. He, but his experience of, well, sounds a little pejorative to me. Is a figure of some Especially given the company that you put me in. Um, <laughs>